Welcome to the September 22, 2022 Community Call for SCRF. Uh, today we are going to have a presentation on both some updates of project management that are happening within SCRF itself. So what is our kind of internal processes and kind of proposing projects and things along those lines. Uh, but also we are going to have a conversation about uh, kind of rigidity versus flexibility, process versus um, maybe we'll just call it openness uh, in DAO spaces as well as kind of the angle um, that we're taking here. Before we get to any of that presentation stuff, we always like to make sure that there is an opportunity for people to, to discuss anything of community value for the good of the order um, you know, that's happening in people's worlds or things that are um, on our radar. So. I will kick this off. Uh, so we do have the cohort. I'm going to go ahead and put that link in the chat just in case people have missed it. Uh, but we have the writing cohort. The deadline for that is tomorrow, September 23rd uh, at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, there is maybe a little bit of wiggle room, but if you are interested in joining this cohort, which I'm really excited about, um, that's basically our deadline. Uh, the cohort will be a four. Well, there's an onboarding week as well. So a five week experience uh, where you will be working closely with a group of people who are also doing kind of weekly writing goals and uh, on the forum itself and responding to various uh, discussions that are already happening on the forum. Kind of an intensive, get some feedback on your writing, connect with some people, commiserate over maybe some of the research that you're having to do to do the quality of writing that you'd like to be doing. Um, I'm very excited for this though, uh, as a cohort for SCRF, um, to be able to get that peer to peer type of feedback uh, going and things along those lines. Um, in addition to that, right after this call is our coffee house chat in our discord. Uh, today, we are going to be uh, having a conversation with the author of one of our uh, forum pieces uh, on what is a DAO. So if you are interested in DAOs and how DAOs run, or if this conversation uh, today in our community call uh, is inspiring to you to kind of think about how do DAO structures work or you know, how does traditional organization maybe map onto ideas around DAOs, that would be a great opportunity for you to join that conversation as well. It's a little bit more casual. It happens on our Discord and one of the live channels. Um, if you have questions on where that is, uh, I'd be happy to direct people to that. Um, beyond that, are there other things kind of going around in the SCURF world that people would like people to know about? Yeah, Ines. Yeah, I just wanted to share the reading group. So uh, I'm going to add the link here. Um, right now we have a, a reading group on the Infinite Machine. It's a great book to actually learn about what, like the beginning of Ethereum and um, and I think we already had the part one session, but we are going to have part two, I think, in two weeks. So yeah, you, you still have time to read the book. It's very easy to read and it's super interesting. So please join us. We had an opportunity to be part of part one, enjoyed it a great deal, uh, and liking part two as well. So hopefully you will join us. Uh, anything else that people have going on in the world of SCURF that they would like to tell us all about? Yeah, Michael. Yeah, thanks, Paul. So just wanted to um, reiterate one more time, uh, Research Pulse newsletter is now uh, live, available to the public. Um, if you would like to sign up or encourage your colleagues or friends to sign up, um, for people who don't know, it's a really great resource of the latest Web3 related research that we aggregate every week. And traditionally, we've shared it via our social channels and we'll continue to do so for the foreseeable future. It is now also available as a uh, newsletter that you can receive in your inbox each Wednesday. So thank you, Maria, for dropping the link. Um, uh, yes, Inez, uh, I think Maria just dropped the Substack link. It is available via Mirror as well. So I'll throw that in the chat um, as well. But yeah, just wanted to remind people. And definitely, if you can share that with your network, that would be fantastic. Well, thank you for reminding us about that, too. I think I'm. I think I'm subscribed. I better be subscribed. So uh, looking forward to getting that in my inbox regularly. Any other announcements for the good of the order today? Cool, cool. All right, so then I will hand it off 
uh, to Ness, who's going to be kind of getting us kicked off on kind of what Scurf is doing. But then, like I said, we'll kind of open it up to um, these tensions in the Web3 space. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, as you mentioned, so I'm going to give you an overview about like what we are doing in terms of the PM process and how we are thinking about it. Um, it's still a work in progress, so I think that's actually something important for me to share. Uh, so please also feel free to share feedback uh, in the chat, but also like if you want to have like a one-on-one -on -one call with me, uh, please, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it so we can discuss things a little bit in more detail. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I don't have a presentation to you. I'm going to just share like our like the process and how we are thinking about it. Um, so let me share the my screen with you. Um, yeah. So basically, uh, it's important to say that the the PM process uh, at Scurf we we have I will call it like two main phases. So one is proposing a new project. Um, sometimes we can say like ah, maybe this is not part of the project management phase, but we decided to act, to bring it together so we have like a, a better flow. And the second part is okay. So now we know that we have a project. What what do we need to do? Um, something that we also when we were thinking about the, the project uh, process, uh, we wanted to make sure a few, that a few things uh, were guaranteed. So first of all, we wanted to make sure that. Every, everyone that works at SCURF, that is a, a part of SCURF, could actually be able to see what's happening uh, without necessarily needing to ask the project manager, the project leader about what's happening. So making sure that the information about the project is, um, uh, and in this case on GitHub, I will show you exactly what I mean by this. But so the information is on GitHub. We know like what is the process, what are, what are the milestones that we want to achieve, what is the timeline, who is working on the project, and, and most importantly, what's happening. So we wanted to make sure that for each one of the uh, project phases, we actually knew exactly what's 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 going on. So basically, making sure there is transparency uh, in the project. The second thing well, that's also very important is to make sure that we don't lose information during the process. And um, with Google Docs and with all, all these like platforms that we are using, it's so easy for us to lose uh, information about the project that we, we were working on or losing information about something that we propose and right now is not the right moment to actually um, go ahead with the project but maybe in the future so how to make sure that we don't lose information and no matter like who, who starts working on the project or, or if we needed to change teams the information um, is over there and the third thing was like how can we make sure that we can work uh, asynchronously. So we have people spread all around the world, sometimes in time zones that not, not, don't necessarily overlap. Um, and honestly, there's a lot of things that we can do and get done without necessarily having uh, meetings. Uh, so how can we, to make sure that the information is there so people can actually work uh, together, uh, but without necessarily the uh, the meetings. We Of course, we believe that uh, in per, like contact uh, and meetings are definitely important and, and they are important important for the health of the uh, of a project but if we uh, decrease the number of those synchronous meetings we believe there is like a lot of value in there so basically overall uh, with this context we start working on like the the project pr uh, process and this is a version one uh, we are aware that we can make the process more complicated. We are aware that we can actually uh, also increase the automations uh, for uh, uh, in, basically that we can use, especially on GitHub. But we wanted to make sure that the first phase is very easy to to, to understand. Something also that uh, important is like we, yeah, basically GitHub is the project management tool uh, that Scurfs use. So we we basically we started from what GitHub has to offer and how can we actually make the most of, uh, of their features. So the first part, as I was mentioning, is proposing a new project. Um, and this is like the, uh, we, we have like a pre-planning uh, uh, phase uh, where we can have basically create a new document. Um, so we have a template for, for, for anyone that wants to propose a project. Uh, if you click here on the template gallery, I won't do it, but then you'll have access to, to this template. Um, 
and then you can basically answer the different questions that uh, or different yeah, questions that we have uh, on that template. Something that was also very important for us was to to make sure that this is not a overwhelming uh, like a questionnaire. So we don't want it to to for people to feel like ah like this is too much work, so I don't want to propose a project. Uh, we, we definitely wanted to uh, make sure that it's open and it's flexible and people feel like. It's uh, kind of easy to, to to answer those questions, but at the same time, we want we also wanted to ask some questions about, for example, alignment with Scurf's mission, uh, vertical where it actually the project will 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 make sense, uh, and then of course uh, like maybe uh, timeline, how much time and how much resources the project will take. So basically, trying to make sure that we ask a few questions that really help um, the team that is going to review the project and then propose um, some ideas really to, uh, to, to basically they have all the information they need to actually make a decision. So that's the, the, the first part. And then of course we have the submitting a proposal. Um, and this is uh, through the proposal issue template. So now we go to GitHub and then we we start proposing um, basically we create an issue that already has the template that uh, we have on the Google Doc and then uh, basically we just need to uh, fill it in. Uh, you might be, uh, might be asking so why uh, a Google Doc and at the same time why like a, pro a proposal issue template. So we'll look at Google Doc as a great tool for collaboration um, uh, GitHub in this specific case is not necessarily a, a, a great for collaboration so we decided to first start the process in, on Google Docs and then go to GitHub. But of course, like if people feel like, OK, so I already have a lot of the information that I need and um, and I, I don't need the, uh, this to happen. So you can always go directly to, to GitHub. So then we, of course, you have the opportunity to track uh, the proposal, uh, the proposal status. So we have a board, you know, like if the project is approved or may, maybe in the future uh, or not approved. Um, and this gives you a, a good idea of like where your project is, um, but also gives anyone a good idea of like what happened with the different projects that were proposed. Um, and maybe in the future we can revisit these projects um, and then um, and maybe uh, start working on them. So basically, this is the, the first part. So proposing um, proposing a project, very simple, very easy, um, but like but with a process that can ensure the three points that, that I mentioned in the very beginning. So then, of course, we start like uh, a project. Um, so the idea here is for you to and actually I'm going to change tabs so I can show you um, a little bit um, like basically show you like how this works. So the idea here is like you go, uh, this is a project that I'm working on. So network mapping, uh, we have like, this is something that is on the operations um, uh, repo. Uh, and then I create a milestone uh, in the uh, init. So for some people, this might be like, I might be talking about things that you don't know about or you are not very used to uh, using GitHub. Um, we we are thinking about like doing some um, training program uh, training program for people that want to use better use GitHub for project management. So we'll have the, the that chance um, in the future. Uh, but but basically the idea here is um, you have this this board with info to do in progress and done. And especially in the info, what we want is to make sure that the information about the project is here. So we we want to make sure that people actually basically if you they, if they want to see what is the project about they can go here and see it if it's a is a very simple project because it's sometimes it, it might be maybe it's not necessarily to use this this um this uh, uh, vision this view with the to do in progress and then and it might make sense to just have all the tasks of the project here. And um, I think in most cases where the, pro the project is a little bit more complex, involves maybe more stakeholders, this, is, is, this will be the standard um, basically uh, process. And then something that is also very important is like, not only that we use uh, these um, uh, basically the, the issues to track our tasks, uh, also to report back on what happened with those tasks, but also we use then uh, this main uh, I will call issue uh, also to update the project um, and update the people that are involved in the project. So what we want to make sure is like whenever people 
come here and they want to understand like what's happening in the project, everything is he in here and there is no questions about like, ah, oh, where is the information? Um, is it lost somewhere? Um, how can I get access to that information? So everything is here, very easy to access, very easy to understand, and we know uh, basically what is the latest update. Going back to uh, the other tab, so I was just, I was telling about like the execution part. There's like a few things here about like assigning the issue to one or more team members using labels and milestones. I don't need to go uh, basically in that detail. Uh, but then something that's also very important for us is to um, basically in the end of the project, make, make sure that the project ends in a good way, that people understand the project is over, but also we are able to um, review the project and learn from what went well and went, what, what went wrong and make sure that everyone uh, in the team can learn from that. So we want to create this project uh, retrospective where some of the questions that we want to see answer is like where we hit or miss our goals, what co caused our resources, the results, and what should we start, stop, and continue doing. This is very used uh, in, for example, agile, metho agile methodology, where in the end we, we always have this project uh, retrospective, and we want to also include this uh, this year. Um, this way, again, I was mentioning, like, we can see the project from the beginning to end. We know what happened along the way. Uh, and, and then we have also the team's, uh, team's feedback on what went well, what didn't went well, and like, what we can learn from, from there. And so basically, overall, this is like what uh, uh, the process is about. Uh, we are working on, we are still working on this and we are implementing uh, this process with some of the projects that are, we are working on um, but now i'm happy to um, answer any questions uh, that you have yeah thank you so much for that presentation um, i know you and the pm team have put like a bunch of work into that so like minimally uh congratulations on all on that type of work that you have been doing um one of the questions that i have that also might lead us or something for us to think about in our larger discussion as well is so a lot of this is being kind of captured uh, within github which happens to be our project management tool um, and i'm kind of wondering for like an organization like scurf where um, people might not always be going into github like on a daily basis or even just kind of in general like DAOs, like they're not going to be necessarily interacting with um, project management tools uh, regularly. Um, I wonder if some of those, like, how do we get or what information might we want to get out of the project management tool and into like some other format elsewhere, like kind of that narrative structure of here's the projects, here's why these things matter and they have value align and all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that's very important is like uh, GitHub and Google Docs will actually come hand in hand. So a lot of the, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, a lot of the collaboration and the work with actually will actually happen in Google Docs. What we wanted to make sure is that each one of the projects that we are developing has a PM that is responsible for updating GitHub. And in some cases, in some teams, people, everyone will use uh, GitHub and will update and basically, uh, basically make sure that information is there. In some other cases, might be the responsible of the PM to, to, to do so. So we wanted to make sure that this is not like a burden for the teams. This is something that adds value, but we also want to be flexible in terms of the way we work with GitHub, Google Docs, or any other tool that people uh, might be using. Well, thank you. Um, anyone else have kind of some questions on this particular process, how this process works, how you might be able to use this process now or in the future? Um, anything along those lines? Yeah, Mikhail. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, how would one get access to the links that you showed in your presentation? Uh, I can share access, I think, uh, with you uh, basically after after the, uh, after the call. Um, yeah, I think that would be easy. Yeah, I can definitely share them with you. Um, one of the reasons I, I say that is because I think it's important to have access to, anyone can have access to these documents. Anyone, mm -hmm. anyone who wants access, there should be a specific place they go and mm -hmm. they click on it and then they can get whatever they like. Um, I think organization is important, but um, access is, yeah. is essential. 
Yes, of course. And we haven't, uh, we uh, we didn't uh, provide access yet because we were still working on it. So we wanted to make sure that it was in a stage where we feel comfortable sharing. Uh, but this is something that we want to make sure that everyone across the organization can access, can use. Um, and that's why I was mentioning the training programs that we want to do, just to make sure that if people have questions, we can we are able to answer. And yeah, and provide a little bit more detail on how to use GitHub for project management. You did great. Cool. Yeah, Brian, go ahead. I have a yeah, just, uh, great information today. Um, I just wanted to add one thing, which is kind of a general advice for, for GitHub. And you know, perhaps you may have your own project board or your team may have your own project board and that you can bring issues into your own project boards, right? So um, you're not necessarily isolated to only use the issues within the project boards in the context that we're speaking about today, but you can also bring them into your own personal project boards and use them contextually there. And it's great because in that way, you're not actually affecting the other project boards where those issues are. Uh, so, you know, it's worth considering that a project board maintains its own set of metadata. So if I bring an issue into my own project board and I maintain my own set of metadata on that issue, it won't affect other project boards. So it won't be disruptive to other processes. I just wanted to mention that as sort of a bit of awareness. Yeah, thanks. And then any other questions on maybe specifically uh, this process? If I recall correctly, um, at least for right now, this process is kind of optimized for like internal like scurf organizational use uh, what would be kind of the next steps like so let's say in the future state of project management at scurf uh, we want to make sure people who are kind of community lender uh, members or maybe the people that find our website would want to add some stuff uh, how much um, additional stuff would we have to be doing in order to get to that space yeah uh, yeah, I think like right now we want to test more this process uh, and make sure that this um, it works well for SCURF uh, and makes and also we actually have two different things here. On one hand, we also we have the proposing a project that in itself is something that actually very important for for SCURF, not only for the members but for anyone outside. And we want to make sure that that process works well, that people feel comfortable. Um, sharing uh, proposals through that process. And then as we go, we are able to open up to the process to uh, anyone, uh, anyone else. But then, of course, we have the uh, basically in the implementation uh, process um, in terms of, OK, so like how can, can we implement the, process, uh, the project? And I think something that it was in our minds from the very beginning was to share like what we learn and how we do it with other organizations so they can also apply it to their organization and of course change it to their own needs uh, but using this as a um as a basically a, an, a some ideas that people can uh, can take from from us and for work for, for what works for us in their own organizations well and i saw a, a hand there for a second um, I think we have a question. Oh, yeah, quick. Peter, go ahead. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the presentation. Awesome. And uh, I believe Brian have also uh, addressed uh, the concern I wanted to raise earlier. But I am uh, used to Jira. I want to know uh, this using the GitHub. Uh, you know, project these days uh, uses uh, agile methodology in terms of iteration, do and releases, and what have you. Uh, this process does it also have uh, a way of uh, a time box process, such that if I have a project within my team, okay, I can allocate a time box for a period duration and a report to also check and get feedback subsequently to know the burnout rate, whether we are meeting the, the, the target based on the period that is allocated and what have you. I'm just looking at it using an agile uh, methodology. Does this um, tools will it fit perfectly? Or if there are other things that we need to also do or something you need to also tell us regarding it? Okay. Yeah, I can 
Uh, go ahead. Can, <laughs> yeah, I can provide a little bit of information. So GitHub out of the box probably is not going to be as reach, as feature rich as you would expect as far as feature parity with um, with Jira. Um, how, how there is time components that are part of the project boards, but I don't think it's in the way that you're uh, looking for. Um, there are, of course, ways to um, customize, although that's not easy. Like you have to kind of like basically reinvent the wheel. However, there are third-party services that build on top of GitHub, such as ZenHub, Z-E-N-H-U-B, and they they probably might have what you're looking for. I'm not as familiar with ZenHub. We looked at ZenHub, and we may look at ZenHub in the future. Um, but basically, ZenHub took GitHub and added a whole bunch of features to make it more like Jira uh, in the way that project management tools and features are concerned. So you might want to look at, at there. Thank you. And Lonnie, I think I saw for a second there that your hand was okay. up. We want to make sure you had the opportunity to speak. If not, you can kind of put questions in the in the, the comments as well, and we can get to those as well. Uh, any other kind of questions that people have, maybe specifically about this process that SCURF is looking to do, kind of its future, um, what type of feedback you might be able to give to help us make it uh, better, at least at this point, anything along those lines. Cool. All right, so this would not be your last opportunity to give that uh, type of feedback. Um, one of the other places that you could give this feedback is this recording um, is going to be up. And also, uh, every one of the community calls ends up with a discussion post or a post, I should say, on the forum itself. So uh, if in the future, like, oh, I have this idea about kind of process and um, kind of project management at SCURF, uh, the thread that this will actually be part of uh, will be a good place to start. Um, since we are at about the halfway point, this might also be a good opportunity for us to change gears a little bit and think about the broader scope um, kind of the broader scope of kind of this tension of process versus openness. But before we get to that, Maria, did you want to jump in with uh, some clarification on kind of the public wiki and all that type of stuff? Sure, happy to. Um, this is PM process adjacent. <laughs> so I didn't want to um, jump in right away. But I do think it's good to point out that we do have a Birth docs page portal already in place. Um, this basically serves as our <clears throat> public wiki. Not everyone may have access to some of the Google Drive files, but everyone has access to this page. Uh, so far, it's been housing some of our um, main documents, but we are expanding it to include all documentation that has existed and will exist <laughs> at SCURP. So uh, these processes, the PM processes, will definitely be featured here. Uh, and any other documents that people have that they want to share um, would be awesome for you guys to send it over to Inesh and I so that we can expand this to include everything around documentation at SCURP. Thank you very much for that reminder and the link. Very important to have the link. Um, so I guess, as I mentioned, like maybe change a little bit of gears, uh, as I think was maybe even suggested you know, by some of the questions that we've already had on this, uh, there is kind of this tension in web threes and DAOs, you know, whatever terminology we would like to use. I would say even kind of an open source culture, all that, of uh, this balance place between kind of process and um, check boxes, right? uh, hierarchies and uh, bureaucracy versus kind of this idea of like we want to have a whole bunch of flexibility and uh, we would like to be able to innovate and try brand new things and process often gets in the way. Um, I know that this is uh, probably going to be one of those perpetual questions that never has a 100% correct answer, uh, but as SCURF is kind of exploring kind of process stuff, as Web3 is 
um, exploring process stuff and DAOs are becoming more sophisticated, uh, I think this would be a really good opportunity for us as a community to talk about what direction we would like to see maybe SCURF be heading in, uh, but also just what are maybe the key questions uh, about around these tensions between process and flexibility. Um, I know that's a, just a huge giant question, uh, but I always rely on SCURF to be able to rise to those huge giant questions. Um, Chris, go ahead and get us started. Yeah, um, I think there is a potential for SCURF to play the role of a neutral party to uh, start these discussions. And I think, um, especially looking at something like DAO, everyone in the Web3 space has a, a, you know, a, a similar but relatively their own definition of what a DAO entails. And even in their uh, operation, many of them don't operate in the same way. So getting together to figure out what constitutes a DAO or what different types of DAOs exist that can be agreed upon, I think, would be a useful role for SCURF to play in that uh, every DAO is going to come asserting that their own version of the DAO is the standard, whereas if we can find a common thread upon or between all of the presented definitions of DAO, then I think we could get closer to a true definition. I think SCURF uh, as a platform or a neutral party could really play a, a huge role in those types of conversations. Yeah, I think that is one of our aspirations. Anesh, go ahead. Yeah, I think I, 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 I would like to go back to what you were mentioning, because I think a lot of people, when when we talk about process in their mind, they, they think about bureaucracy um, and they think about things that we all hate and we don't want to deal with. Um, but I also feel like, especially in DAOs and Web3, I think like context is so important and sometimes so difficult to get uh, that some process can actually be helpful. I think a lot of the times whenever I join a DAO or an organization, it takes me a, a while to actually onboard, especially when there is no context for me to understand like what has been, what, what, or what are people doing, what has been done and how um, thing, things are done inside the organization. Each organization has a different culture, a different ways, or a different way of doing them. Sometimes th these things are very uh, immaterial. People just like know. Uh, but but I think especially in DAOs, especially when we are we're also working remotely from different parts of the world with also very different cultures, uh, I think it's very important that we have some kind of process because that also helps um, with context, but also helps uh, with uh, making sure that we don't lose any information. Um, so the, I, I personally feel like um, if um, traditional corporations need some kind of process, I think sometimes they go overboard and they have too many. But I, I also think that DAOs also need, actually, I think maybe actually need more, um, more pro not processes, but at least a culture that really writes things, uh, things down. Uh, and we and it's easy for us to access um, how are how are things done um, because I think that will help solve one of the problems that people uh, identify as uh, the, one of the worst problems in DAOs that is the onboarding and the path to contribution and I think that's this is a great way of uh, really making things easy for people that want to to do so. Yeah, thanks for uh, kind of making those points about process. So this is actually something, especially in a distributed environment. Um, so this is something that I have gotten from um, Infinite Machine, like reading Infinite Machine and, and just kind of other readings. Um, some of the taken for granted things of these startups uh, is the importance of hacker houses are kind of like this, they're kind of cohabitating, right? Uh, and they are sharing culture like very quickly and immediately. Um, and so it can look like they're just kind of winging it and they don't really have any process and all that type of stuff. But a lot of that is actually being carried by like the conversation that they're having uh, with each other in real time. And when you are distributed the way SCURF and many DAOs are, you know, the, those processes are actually the things that carry uh, culture and carry um, values and, and meanings along those lines. So that was a very cool uh, observation. Um, I think I saw a hand or was it just the, the comment? 
thing went up. I think it was just a comment. <laughs> just the comment thing went up. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I'd also be you know, so with that idea of potentially process being the carrier of onboarding and the carrier of culture and stuff like that. And so um, to me, that suggests that any process that a DAO or SCURF produces has to be more than um, checkboxes, right? So checkboxes are a simple way to also collect some information. You can have a brief description about how a project is intended to work and here's a list of goals and we did them or we didn't do them. Um, I'd be really interested in you know, what does a process need to look like or what does or how does a process best uh, convey a narrative uh, to the point that kind of Anesh was just kind of making. So I'm interested in people's thoughts on that. Yeah, Mikhail, go for it. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I really like the idea of onboarding. Um, I'm not particularly experienced with Web3 and DAOs, but um, I think this space has the opportunity to bring all types of people from all types of backgrounds. Um, but with that, it has to be simple. It has to be easy. It can't have jargon in it that people, like, I just learned what our onboarding was. And I was like, okay, from this meeting, I have that, that intelligence. But I think it's important that these um, onboarding processes are simple so that you have more people coming in so that they can get into the rhythm of things and actually contribute to more people coming, you know? And then that's how you build a community. That's how you build something that's open source because if it's, if it's only a particular like click, then it, it can become something that is not designed to be, you know? Um, so that was my point. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really important point of kind of accessibility um, especially as as an industry, as Web3, as an industry kind of grows, it's going to be intersecting with other legacy industries and uh, people who are maybe not kind of computer science first uh, are going to be major contributors to this space uh, in the future, like now and in the future. Um, and so as we think about organizations that are developing processes, uh, how do you make sure that we are still being precise with what we need, but are able to reduce jargon and increase accessibility of documents and things like that. So I would say accessibility is maybe one of the first things that we should be thinking about when it comes to these kind of processes. John, go ahead. Yes, uh, there we go, okay. Um, I'll come at this from a sort of devil's advocate perspective and say jargon is incredibly useful to a degree uh, because from the thousand foot view, a process processes are about people without people the process is completely useless so you need to think about what type of people you want to bring in and how you bring them in so if you want to bring in um for simplification let's just say there's two type of people people who lead projects and people who want to do tasks within projects so if you want to bring in the people who end up leading projects in a year you're going to want to find people who ask questions about the jargon like oh who are willing to say, I don't know what that word means. Can someone please teach me? And then someone teaches them and that's it. That's the process for bringing that person in. If you wanna bring someone who's more task oriented, you wanna have a, a task list where they can just go and they, they, don't, they maybe don't wanna see the jargon, but they go there, here's a simple task, do this thing, fill out the spreadsheet, let us know when you're done, great. And then you can elevate them down the task track while you elevate the other person down the leadership track. Um, so I. I I think we might uh, be cognizant of losing people as we think about building process and, and making sure we're building processes because we have people who are looking to go through these processes. Uh, and at the same time, there's the, the fear of, uh, is it Schrodinger's cat? I don't know. Once you look at the process, once you write it down, you've actually ruined it. And uh, because it's actually a process that's run by people who understand what's going on. And now that you've explained the rules to the game, people will play the game to break it sort of thing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Anesh, go ahead. And then uh, Ivan dropped a link to one of our interviews. And maybe Ivan, if uh, you could kind of think about what are the kind of the key points that we'd want to bring into 
this conversation, that'd be helpful. But yeah, Anesh, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, to share, I think because when uh, Jonathan was mentioning the, the people, I think like we, we need to make sure that the processes that they, uh, we create serve both the people that are working in the organization and the organization. Uh, and that's what we try to do with the PM process was to, okay, what are the needs for of the, or, of the organization? Um, and so a lot of times the needs are, as I mentioned, context, making sure that we don't lose any information, making sure that we can actually work asynchronously, but also what are the needs of the individual people. And here is, again, context, but also making sure that there is a path that they can follow. And um, of course, like giving enough flexibility, but being very clear about what are the expectations and so on. I think a lot of the times we all have been in organizations and in situations with, where we don't know the expectations, we don't know what, like, okay, we need to propose a project. Is this a one-liner or is this a 20-page document? And this way we, it's very clear what is expected and so people can uh, do the, the work uh, uh, in that matter. So I think it's also, uh, I think a lot of the times people rebel against process. Uh, and bureaucracies because they are done for the organization, especially when you have to uh, fill in 10 forms for you to ask for uh, an expense or something. I think it's important that when we, we are looking at process, we take this, both these views. And sometimes like inside the people that are going to use the process, we have different uh, like different roles and profiles. Sometimes it's like in the, in the case of the uh, of the the, pr the proposing uh, part of the process, we have the the person that is proposing, but we also have the person that is going to review the process, and then we have the organization, and then we have people that might want to find out about what is the uh, what, what what basically what is SCURF working on and what is SCURF focusing on. So we need to take all of this into consideration to make sure that uh, yeah we have a process that people feel comfortable with and uh, and want to follow. Yeah, I think that is a good point about the the type of bureaucracy that people push back on or the type of process um, when it feels completely pointless, uh, when it feels like doing the process takes more time than actually doing the task or accomplishing the task. Uh, obviously, we would like to avoid these things. Uh, we want to make sure that when people have to interact with processes, that they are deriving value from it uh, as well. Yeah, Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, and to, to your point, Enos, uh, one of the the um, strengths, I think, of what you were describing is the idea of every project having a project lead that essentially does the uh, footwork of getting all the docs in the right place and just making sure they're they're done right. So you can leave, like if you make a project, you're taking that on. That's, that's your responsibility. You can leave everything else to other people. Uh, let them just build their own whatever. And you know, you're just, all you need to do is say, send me the link when you're done and I will do the rest of it. That seems to free a lot of people up uh, and makes people more willing to to get in there. Because at the end, the, the outcome of process is what you're describing. The organization, the ability to show off, like, this is what we're doing. This is where you can contribute. Uh, and everyone loves to see that, uh, but not everyone wants to contribute to building that, like you're saying. So it's it's the, the project head giving them the tools to just copy, paste, whatever, into the right uh, category or right board on GitHub seems like it's going to be very effective. And Ivan, I don't want to put you too much on the spot. Hopefully I gave you a little bit of fair warning that I might, though. Um, was there anything from that particular discussion in the podcast that really resonated you, with you, what you're talking about when it came to that standardization um, that Dalstar was talking about or Dalstar 1 was talking about? Let's see if he responds. Uh, no worries. Uh, so I guess that does, I mean, maybe with the idea of um, standardization. So I do know that in Web3 and DAOs, like there is a lot of discussion also of like what stuff should be standardized based on what we're kind of talking about today and kind of the goals of uh, processes being um, context rich and narrative rich. Uh, is that a, does that suggest that overall standardization of processes from DAO to DAO is maybe less achievable or that the goal of standardizing certain types of practices um, 
is less achievable. So one of the things that we had been talking about with this project is, you know, we're figuring out some processes and other DAOs or other organizations might be able to pick them up and just kind of run with them and make their adaptations uh, with the idea of kind of this being so narrative and context dependent. Um, does that kind of threaten those types of efforts across the space to kind of borrow and copy processes? Yeah, Chris. Yeah, I don't think it necessarily threatens it. Um, I think the big problem becomes um, redundant processes that could have been identified early on that get time wasted on redeveloping the same process over and over. So if anything, um, I think there are probably many DAOs doing the same thing, retreading the same project development process, wasting time on actually doing that when it's going, as it's context dependent, all of the DAOs are going to be able to be fit within an industry. So if a DAO is dealing with art, it's going to, you know, there's going to be digital art or physical art that can be broken down into a respective industry in which that context is going to have standards within it. Um, so I think even uh, it's, it's almost the opposite where it's not that it's going to be impossible to create standards. It's more so the effort has to be put into identifying where the common standards occur rather than um, assuming everyone is doing things different because their DAO is unique in some strange, you know, obtuse uh, trait. But when in actuality, it probably has a lot more common characteristics than with other DAOs within that same industry. Yeah, Maria, I saw you had your hand up too. Hi, uh, yeah, I wasn't gonna speak exactly to DAO standards, but overall, I think this is such an interesting discussion. It's like to um, Inesha's point on a lot of the people's is like, how do you walk that fine line of having just enough process and, um, ways of people understanding the org that it's helpful, but not so much that you bog all things down, you don't have innovation and uh, people are doing process for process sake. I think it's, yeah, like such an interesting exploration and so easy to skew in one direction or another. Um, the one thing that did come to mind as you were talking about it is um, Nathan's community rule project, where I don't know who has checked it out. I'll drop a link. Um, we've actually sponsored his project or like parts of the project. Um, but he creates like governance toolkit for communities. And if you want to check out like some of the templates he has, it's really interesting because it's showing what process could look like based on the type of community, which is really interesting. So um i don't necessarily have a viewpoint on this but it does standardize it to a certain degree and like has this exploration around what process looks like based on the type of community which i just think is like a really interesting exploration what process do you ideally want if you have a consensus type of org versus like an elected board type of org um just something cool for people to explore Thank you for that reminder on that project. That is a cool project. And uh, I'm also going to find some of the posts that are on our forum as well as uh, his site. Um, but yeah, Chris, go ahead. I think there is um, an issue of the, I mean, this obviously gets back to context. In some cases, an organization is trying to uh, experiment and discover a new type of emergent uh, organizational structure, whereas others have a specific goal in mind, so they don't really have the time to experiment on allowing an emergent structure to happen organically. So I think that's where, um, in some cases, like, for example, SCURF is, is a great example. Uh, there was an attempt to not impose too many strict, rigid structures early on to see what could organically uh, occur in this environment when there is capital and some guidance, but a, a, some semblance of freedom for the structure to 
morph and and evolve within an amorphous uh, hierarchy that is loose but not strict. And I think that's where being in you know startups that are looking for experimental uh, structures is different than being in a startup that is working towards a specific goal. And I think this gets back to obviously the context being important, but in some cases there are attempts to allow new uh, types of engagements or structures to occur. Yeah, that is a very good point about kind of the fluidity here. Um, in that fluidity, though, like that's going to have to be supported by some type of, um, like, how do you build, how do you build processes that support fluidity? I guess is maybe a needlessly um, pithy question, uh, but something that just kind of popped in my mind. Uh, in like, yeah, Anesh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Um, going back to uh, basically your question, I think a lot of the times the structure of the organization, no matter which one it is, um, also comes from the values that the organization has um, or the principles that is based on. Um, so uh, if we look at tech companies, like they, they might be working technology and, and they might like look similar from the outside, but sometimes like they have completely different company cultures and which leads to completely different organizational um, and also processes. Um, I'm sure Apple and Google have very different ways of working, um, even though they are both of them uh, very successful trillion dollar companies. So what I believe is like even in DAOs, I think we can definitely learn from each other. And for example, Talent DAO, uh, R&D uh, R &D DAO, I don't know, uh, they do a lot of like research about like how DAOs should work. And I think that's, that's amazing. And I think we can learn a lot from th those experiences. And also again, going, try to implement based on like how we want to work. I remember like one day I was talking with a friend of mine that w does a lot of work uh, around co a company culture. Um, and he was mentioning that a lot of the times uh, organizations say like, ah, we really promote autonomy inside of our organization. And then when people arrive on the first day, they have like a checklist of everything that they have to do. And they have like, and basically what you are saying is like the opposite of autonomy. We are just saying like, this is what, this is the process that you have to follow. So now do it. Uh, if you want to promote autonomy from day one, um, and I think a lot of times expectations from day one are, are, are very important, uh, you need to, to really bring that value uh, into uh, your onboarding process, for example, um, to make sure that then the expectation is set and people know what, like, what, what is going to happen next. Um, so I think like aligning values with processes is actually super important. Go ahead, Mikhail. Um, do y'all think it would be valuable to have values be project specific? So instead of, um, say, for instance, one person wants to run their project like Facebook would, and another one wants to run it more like Google, they make it apparent that that's how they're going to run their project rather than everyone following a specific modality. I don't know. It's what do y'all think? Ahead. I think that is the idea of cryptocurrency, and I freaking love it. So it's anarchism. So the idea is that you build an underlying process, an underlying infrastructure that unites every project, as we're using the word here. Uh, and then every project operates by its own value set. But you're still all tied by that base value set that Enos was just describing. This goes back to process should be defined by people. It's about, it's not about, uh, it, it helps organization, but it's about people. Uh, so if you have 20 different projects, one of them can be, uh, I'll go to governance models here, one can be a dictatorship and the other can be a pure direct democracy, but they live next to each other side by side and they're all tied, they're both tied together by an underlying process. Uh, and, and I think that comes with a lot of value because some projects I think uh, in, in Scurf's case are going to need to, like you, you need to complete the project within a week you're not going to have a decentralized system to complete a project within a week. You need to have someone in charge that's just like kind of cracking a whip, like, hey, we got to get this done. Let's get this done. Do, 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 do. And then they complete anything that needs to get done after the week sort of thing. So I think it's a really good idea and it fits the ethos of cryptocurrency uh, 100%.
Uh, I think we are already seeing some of that too happening in um, in DAOs, where DAOs are launching sub DAOs, where there's like different like a different structure uh, of work, uh, sometimes with some centralization uh, to make sure that things go faster and on very specific tasks. So I think like even DAOs, I think everyone is trying to experiment with different organization models. Um, to to get things done, but I completely agree. So maybe a sub DAO has a, a, a kind of culture, another sub DAO can have a, a very different culture, but the underlying goal is to reach um, the the goals of the organization. Yeah, and when it um, when you you start to zoom out a little bit, uh, it uh, the possibility that DAOs are not a new thing sort of seeps into your, your brain and it's like, oh man, we've had DAOs since like ancient Rome. It's just an organizational structure and then a substructure. And so we're, we're talking about standardization of DAOs. I don't think that is a thing that can exist, um, but it, it, you're going to have a bunch of these experiments and in uh, a specific context, one operational process is going to be much more valuable than another. So in ancient Rome, when there's a war, you need to appoint a Caesar so that you can go to war and defeat the or conquer the barbarians, right? But then when there's not a war, you step back and you let the democracy rule until someone screwed that all up for everyone. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of value here. Uh, and to I forget who mentioned it earlier, but the idea of a flexible system, I think that's the new aspect. We're playing with technology that can build uh, these processes to be flexible. So as the the process identifies the context, identifies something that is needed because of the external environment, the process automatically shifts to um, accommodate that need. Uh, that would be very cool. That might be out of the scope of SCURF, though. At least for today. I would right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we are just about at time. Um, some of this DAO conversation, though, I could easily see going into the coffee house. So I strongly recommend people to continue this conversation in the coffee house in our Discord, uh, in the live channel, where we'll be talking about what is a DAO. Uh, and we might be able to explore some of these additional questions. Um, and with that, I hope you all have a delightful day wherever you may be. And thank you so much for spending some of your day uh, with us in our community call.